Nancy, are we ready to start? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, we have uh, the people, the, the lines are all on. We're yes, ready to go? Sir. Yes, sir. So I call this meeting to order. Uh, <laughs> for the member of the public, media, press, anybody else on the phone, we welcome everyone. However, we like to ask you to mute your phone, and you can do that by pressing a star six. It's extremely important for you to mute your phone because we can hear you. So we really, really appreciate it. One more time, please mute your phone. On hold. That's right. Put it on a star six. And uh, so, and if you have any question later on, you can call our office in Tallahassee, and we'll be happy to answer every question uh, that you have. So um, with that, um, I'd like for Dr. McKee to do a, a roll call, please. Yes, sir. Um, Governor Beard. Here. Governor Tripp. Here. Um, Mr. Chair, members of your committee are here. Would you like for me to see what members have called in and other members that are yes, present? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Governor Perez. Yep. Governor Coltson. Governor Core. Governor Duncan, Governor Frost, Governor Marshall, Governor Martin, Governor Parker, Governor Robinson, Governor Reed, Governor Stavros, Governor Temple, Governor Yost. Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, what I like to do is that um, on the USF side. Um, Madam President, uh, uh, I'd like for you or and have everyone in the room to introduce themselves. So if, you, if you're okay with that, sure. we'll start with you. Um, go ahead. Judy Genshaft, uh, President of the University of South Florida System. And I, I'll just go. Yeah. Oh, you want me to introduce yeah. Yeah. David Tustin, I'm interim uh, Chancellor and CEO of the University of South Florida Polytechnic. Uh, Steve Mitchell, trustee of the USF. Brian Lamb, trustee, University of South Florida System. Stephanie Goforth, trustee, University of South Florida System. And I'm Byron Shin, uh, USF System trustee and a CPA here in Florida. Okay, and I'd like to go back and, and uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Nick Trubinovich, USF, the media business. Finance. I'm John Long, the Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President of the University of South Florida. You're the man with the money, huh? <laughs> John? No, the man with no money. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Stephen Prevost, General Counsel at USF. Nice. Kathleen Moore, Associate Vice President for System Initiatives at USF. Uh, James Payne, Regional Vice Chancellor of Brown County Affairs and Research at USF Polytech. Alice Murray, Regional Vice Chancellor for Campus Planning at USF Polytechnic. <laughs> okay. Regional Vice Chancellor Assessment Accountability at USF Polytechnic. Welcome. Margaret Sullivan, Regional Chancellor, University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. Margaret, good to see you. Russ Abrams, Central Florida Regional Representative for the Governor's Office. Thank you. I keep going and yes, make sure we know everybody. Um, who's back there? Vicky, 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 Vicky uh, you know, I usually like to have my lawyer on my side. Uh, is there, I think there's an extra chair here. Can you? Can you? Can you, can you have mine. Yeah. <laughs> no, no chair, so I got it. I need you here, too. So, can you please join us here? Uh, yes, you know, I'd be happy to. And, uh, if I'm out of order, just, just kick me or give me a sign. She will. And let's go to our ma a man with the money. All right, Jim Jones, Board of Governors staff. I'm Dan Holstenbeck, Vice President of University Relations at UCF. I'm here to present a gift. would say, allow me to say to all of you how pleased we are to host you at, at any time, and uh, you just call us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us. We really appreciate all your help. You guys have always been a huge help to us. And please send our regards to Dr. Head. Will do. 
Hi, Tim Campbell. I'm an outside counsel at the general counsel's office in Polytechnic. <laughs> okay. Randy Nolan, Board of Governors, Chief of Staff. I'm Kim Wilma from the Tampa Bay Times. Welcome. Rick Shaw, UCF Vice President, Chief of Staff. Gene Frontmeyer from the UCF Office of News and Information. Jan Otto, Mesa's Office at UCF. Nice to see you. I'm Valerie Greco. I'm the UCF Board of Trustees Student Assistant. Nice to see you. Nathan Great. Marshall, is Chief of Staff, UCF President's Office. Welcome. Well, thank you so much um, for, for joining us. Um, I, I really appreciate if you guys can put your phone on mute uh, or your cell phone, um, um, if you could look at it. Um, and I think I just done mine, yes. Um, so the way we'll uh, conduct this meeting, I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, our purpose here is a, a very narrow mandate by the uh, Board of Governors. And the mandate is uh, for us to be, to, with, in collaboration with USF Board and its administration, to see to it that uh, at the end of the day, assuming all the criteria are met, that we have a 12th university. That is the mandate that's been given to us. Um, and uh, we are very serious about this mandate. I see it a, a personal uh, mandate to me because anything, I always, when somebody um, uh, puts me in a committee, I'm very serious at what I do. When, when we were together in totality, our board, uh, we all have, could have agree on issue or disagree on issue, but once in a democracy a vote is taken, I am on my way to support that issue and be on our way. So we have uh, we had a, a call, a telephonic call that we had a few days ago, and and then we have received you know a lot of. Um, uh, a press report about well, how things happen and, and, uh, and the press have their own jobs and, and we, have, um, um, we have ours. Um, to, to me and to our committee, I see that as a collaboration. <coughs> and I can tell you, the, the conference call that we have, I think it was the best thing that has happened to us, to all of us, because we made it very clear to what we are looking for. And I think um, it was good for USF, it was good for us to understand. I have to tell you the collaboration that I have received personally uh, from the USF group um, and, and calling me, discussing different issues with me, uh, it's just been incredible. So I want to thank the President and the Board of Trustees uh, for this. Um, I feel for you guys, you know, <clears throat> your president, um, he gets a big box, and, and, and you and I have to sit here and, and see through. Thank you so much, Madam uh, President. And um, I also want to welcome our Chancellor, Frank Brogan, is here. Um, and um, Chancellor, would you like to uh, say something? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank you to UCF. I'm going to echo something that um, our chairman just said. We're actually doing, the system is doing double duty here today. Not only is UCF kind enough to host this meeting, uh, but also just across campus, uh, UCF is hosting a statewide meeting where we invited to come to Florida uh, the National Science Foundation representatives. And there are, uh, because I was there along with President Hitt, and he does. I'm going to echo his apology, uh, apologies. He's on the other side of town at a long scheduled meeting uh, with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but we were able to welcome 350 people, uh, researchers, vice presidents, deans, uh, and a host of others, uh, according to the representatives of the National Science Foundation, who are there to talk about the NSF and what they can do for us and what we can do to better collaborate with the National Science Foundation. Uh, they claim that this is the largest such gathering they've ever had. So Florida showed very well uh, today, and in part because the University of Central Florida was kind enough to 
to open their doors and provide us the people to help coordinate the activities with our staff uh, and it's a remarkably successful endeavor so thank you UCF um, I also wanted to say thank you to uh, all of the volunteers as the chairman mentioned who are working so hard on this particular issue today's meeting is very important not only logistically uh, as I know we're going to see played out in terms of how we move this initiative forward but I think it is also a very important statement that uh, the people surrounding this table and ultimately tables like it in Tallahassee and in uh, Tampa and in Lakeland uh, are going to put their best effort forward to make sure that the motion that was passed by the Board of Governors some weeks ago at Florida Atlantic University becomes a reality and I think today is a very important uh, logistical statement but just an important statement in general that we're going to do this together and that we're going to turn something um, that is vision into a very important reality for the people of the state of Florida. So uh, our staff is uh, ready, willing, and able to be a partner in that endeavor. And I know I speak for all 17 members of, of my board, and that's a dangerous thing to do uh, uh, typically, but I can do it today and tell you that they are all behind this effort. We appreciate all of your valuable time. Uh, coming to the table to make sure that we are a success. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and we look forward to this and future meetings on the subject. Thank you, um, uh, Chancellor. Um, at this point, I'd like to get a motion to approve uh, the minutes. So moved. Second. We have a motion, and we have a second in discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. I oppose. Motion carried. I will thank uh, my colleague, um, Norm Tripp and Dick Beard um, for being and, and working with me uh, on this um, um, uh, on this <laughs> what endeavor that we we're about to take. And Tico, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate that. Um, okay, so what we would do is uh, we will have this meeting on a quarterly basis. We will get together and uh, work together. And so at this point, uh, uh, Mr. Lamb, um, Mr. Madam President, however you want to handle, so if you want to start, give us the progress and, and take us down the line of how you are coming along. Sure, sure. First of all, I'd like to say good morning. Again, I'll introduce myself. I'm Brian Lamb. I live in Tampa, Florida. And I'm uh, fortunate enough to be a member of our USF System Board of Trustees and an alumnus as well, and this is a privilege uh, to get a chance to spend some time with you this morning. So I, I really thank you on behalf of all of our uh, trustees who some are here and some were unable to be here. We would like to spend some time with you this morning to have a conversation. Uh, and I think the way we're set up today will we'll make that very easy to do and not only talk through some of the agenda items, I think you'll hear from uh, President Ginshaft, uh, our Interim Chancellor, uh, Mr. Touchton, and talk about progress. We also would like to update you on what we think are some substantive priority benchmarks that have been outlined, set forth by the Board of Governors, and where we've made progress and why we've prioritized those. So you'll hear about that as well. Uh, we also like to talk a little bit about timelines uh, and give you some color around our initial findings. Uh, what I'd share with you just as a little bit of a backdrop is over the last two or three weeks, because it's, it's just been that narrow of a window, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of effort and work put in, and not just by the volunteers. I really do want to acknowledge the USF leadership and staff. Uh, they, they've really made some progress. So today we're going to make that tangible for you. We're going to try to put some color around what does progress look like. The first item on the agenda I would like to talk about is, is fairly important because I want to level set some of the roles and responsibilities of the Oversight Committee. Uh, in December, in the early part of December, Chair John Ramil put this committee in place. And, and so I, I just want to make sure before we dive into the details that we're very clear on why, and I'll spend just a minute on that, and then also talk about the roles and responsibilities. and, and there are some foundational themes, and I use that term very intentionally, because there are some foundational themes that are, are really going to be the drivers for the activities and behaviors of this oversight committee. 
Number one is we take this directive very seriously. Chair Hassani, we share your passion around that. Make no mistake, this is, this is important not just to us at this table, but for all of the citizens for Florida. So we've got to get this one right. Uh, so that you, you, you've got our, there will be a sense of urgency that you will see uh, and a tenacity that you will see around achieving the benchmark. So we do take it seriously. There will also be a high level of accountability. And again, these are foundational themes that the Oversight Committee is focused on. And I, I want to say accountability again. One of the core activities that the volunteers are focused on are making sure that we're holding accountable the USF leadership and other stakeholders that are part of achieving these benchmarks on a regular basis. And I know we're going to meet quarterly. I, I want you to have a high confidence level that we're going to be holding folks accountable on a much more regular basis than that. And so we'll, t we'll talk about that as well. Now and through the entire life cycle of this committee, we will operate with full transparency. Uh, and so today I hope is going to be a real tangible example of that transparency. And as you mentioned, uh, Chair Asani, I know Chancellor Brogan is important to you is the collaboration. Uh, we've got to get that right. Uh, eliminate any perceptions that there may not be collaboration and and that rests also on the shoulders of this committee so that's a that's a foundational theme and then lastly uh, I, I don't think we would any of us would really be doing our jobs unless we felt like we were ensuring the resources particularly the fin financial resources that are going to be allocated to this effort are in the best interests interest of the citizens for the state of Florida uh, so again that's a it's not a specific benchmark, but feel comfortable that that's way up on our radar screen and foundational to the behaviors of the committee. I just want to spend a minute talking about some other core now roles and responsibilities over and above the foundational responsibilities. Uh, this committee was formed really primarily, quite honestly, to your point, and I think narrow is the right word, for the focus of achieving the benchmarks. I mean, at the end of the day, that, that's really what this committee is here for. So, you know, we're going to achieve the minimum requirements necessary for separation of our USF Polytech campus. That, that's a, a core purpose of this committee. Now, when we, when we talk about doing that, I think there's, it's equally important to say we're going to do that in a timely and quality manner. We can't sacrifice, in the essence of speed, quality. There will be a balance. Sometimes we will agree or disagree on those balances, but I, I, I hope that we can come to a common ground that there will be a sense of urgency, but hopefully we won't sacrifice or put at risk the quality of the education of our students or the impact in the community for the sake of speed. The USF Oversight Committee is an important point I do want to acknowledge. We are not a replacement or a substitute for our campus board. The campus board has been in place. It will continue to be in place. It serves a very important, particularly fiscal responsibility role for our Polytech campus. We, we are not here to replace that. None of us have, have volunteered to do that. I want to make sure before we leave that there's no misunderstanding around that. Uh, campus board plays a key role. We'll continue to do that. This committee also is not here to replace the board of trustees <coughs> for the university system. Uh, that, that's a critically important group and we are simply a subset of them to focus on this, this narrowly defined scope. So I, I thought it was important to highlight that point. Governance is the primary focus of this committee. If I could, if you, if you had, had to draw really a distinction between what the USF leadership and the staff and faculty are focused on versus the committee, it's primarily governance for us. And, and let me give you some color around that. That includes a couple of items that we've even prioritized you're going to hear more about today. Uh, items like accreditation, a key benchmark we feel like in the process we've got to get right collectively. Facilities, uh, that's a significant, you know, it's a significant effort. There are a lot of folks involved in that. We'd like to give you a substantive update today, or today on our progress. I think you're going to be pleased with what you hear and our findings. Student enrollment, I mean, ultimately that's, that's our customer. Uh, is the student and I, I Chancellor Brogan I've heard you say time and time again talking about that's the constituency ultimately we've got to stay true to uh, in our activities so those are some some activities that you're going to hear about around governance 
We're also going to update you on the regional chancellor search. Our president's going to talk about that. It's a little bit outside the scope of governance, uh, and so I just want to make sure I do draw that distinction. Around governance, I've asked Trustee Mitchell, uh, who's going to spend some time talking about the facilities. He's going to be a part of the action committee, which uh, inter, uh, CEO Touchton is going to talk about. The reason that's important is Trustee Mitchell brings a very, you know, very good background, rich background around the legal aspects, the, the, the facilities aspects, and the due diligence around making sure we get the facilities right. It's a big part of the benchmark, and so we wanted to make sure we stacked one of our best volunteers on that, and he's going to be able to provide some color today around that as well. Fiscal oversight wasn't a specific call out in the benchmarks. And, and that was intentional to some degree, but, but it's clearly an underlying tone throughout all of the benchmarks. And because of that, we're also going to ask uh, Trustee Byron Shin, who's a very well-respected CPA and businessman in, in, the, in the Florida market, to focus and partner with our campus board, as well as the USF Polytech leadership around fiscal responsibility. As you think about all of the activities that are going on, I want you to have a high comfort level uh, that we haven't lost sight of. We've got a good make, make fiscally sound, and I'll use a key phrase that I, I want you also to be comfortable, sustainable decisions. So three years, five years, 20 years from now, we want to feel good about the decisions we've made around our fiscal, fiscal responsibility. So Trustee Shin's going to spend some time working with uh, David Touchton on that as well. Our other trustees, uh, Trustee Jordan Zimmerman and Trustee Goforth, are going to play a key role helping us, particularly around the programmatic side of the benchmarks, uh, making sure from a community standpoint that we're having a, a really open dialogue, uh, being very strategic in terms of how we attract the right talent and the right quality of talent. I spoke about quality earlier. So those are going to be other activities in the life cycle that, that we really focus on and ask trustees to participate around. Um, just a couple of other points, and then, then I'll wrap up and I'll ask um, you know, President Ginshaft to give us uh, another update is we're fo heavily focused around governance, but I, wanted, I want to make clear that the, the, the Oversight Committee, nor the Board of Trustees for that matter, is going to get involved in day-to-day decision-making on the Polytech campus. And I know we, we share that philosophy around drawing that, that fine line that we will be involved there will be accountability. A fair amount of due diligence will be going on. But I also want to give you some comfort that we aren't going to replace the highly talented staff that we've got in the day-to-day -day decision making. That's why we've got an interim CEO in place and we're quickly looking for a long-term permanent solution as well. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with the roles and responsibilities. Some of those probably were familiar to you. We did talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, Chair Hassani on your, on your conference call. I thought it was important to at least level set the rest of our meeting around roles and responsibilities and particularly foundational themes that are key, such as accountability, such as governance. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause for a second and, and I know this is a conversation, so if there are any questions, I'll be... I do have sure. one question there. Yeah. Sure. Might want to, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we all might want to identify ourselves for the people on telephone. Okay. Uh, Governor Norman Tripp, um, you said that the campus board will stay in place. Could you talk to me a little bit about what you intend to do in terms of the interaction of that? There has been some concern uh, addressed to me by people that uh, they have not had enough involvement. Sure. And, and they are in place. So I, if you could just talk to me about how you see their role and, and how, how you intend to interact with them and how they can be, be part of it. Because I understand that they're a local community board. Absolutely. I, think, I actually think it's a timely question. And I'll comment and then I'll ask, actually ask uh, David Touchton to talk because the expectation really is that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of the, the more frequent interaction. So let me make an initial comment. I've got full confidence that that's something that, I, that we're going to get better at. If there's, if there's been an, a, a perception that we aren't having that dialogue, we'll, we'll rectify that. But let me tell you what we, what we are going to do. Uh, for example, uh, there's already a scheduled board meeting 
uh, for the campus board on the Polytech campus. I will be attending that meeting and providing a fairly robust update for not just this meeting, but some of our other activities. Equally important, uh, our CEO, our interim CEO Touchton is going to be at that meeting and providing a very detailed update on the action committees, their activities, and, and you're gonna get that update first. So you're gonna get a preview of what that conversation is going to look like. So a tangible example is in the board, board meeting, which is an open meeting, we will be providing transparency on a daily basis. I'll, I'll hand it over to David to talk a little bit about some of the things he's going to do to make sure we solve for any gaps or perception of gaps there. Brian, who's on that board? Just so I, can, I can help you yeah, with that. Good. I, I know all of them. Let's uh, just, uh, uh, let me, uh, so for, let's just do one at a time. So please raise your hand and I uh, um, identify you and, and then you can say what you want to say. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Touchton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the actual chairman is Trustee Gene Engel. Uh, the members are Michael Carter, a CPA and a former partner of mine, and uh, uh, the attorney. So Ron Morrow, who developed two economic developments, he used to own savings and loan. Uh, Bonnie Parker, who's with SunTrust, and Mark Kaler and Mark Cater, who's an attorney that practices in Polk County. And I think that's all of them. It's a very small board. Right. It's a yeah. Okay. Um, who was is, who is the first name? I'm sorry. The first he, one you mentioned. Trustee Gene Engel. Gene Engel. Okay. He, he's Thank the you. chair. Um, Mr. Sheen. This is Trustee Shen. I'd like to add that even though I'm on the system trustee board, I, I'm from the Manatee County, Braden and Sarasota area, and I also serve on the Sarasota Bradenton campus of USF. And I'm the liaison for that. And part of what I bring to the table is just what you talk about, how it feels being on that campus, that regional campus. And also, I might add Stephanie Goforth is our representative and she should speak for herself, but she's also representative toward our St. P campus, toward <coughs> our system-wide. So you have two of our regional campuses, delegates that sit on our system board. So we are very sensitive to that connectivity, and obviously we've lived it in our own roles within the system. You have a yeah. question? Okay. Um, I just want to, um, Mr. Lamb, thank you so much. About, it was a, uh, I just want to so get a clear understanding that, that the uh, Board of Trustees of USF have uh, accepted the, the decision was made uh, by the Board of Governors and the uh, Board of Trustees of USF um, created the Select Committee. You, uh, Mr. Lamb, as the Chair of the Select <coughs> Committee, and they have given you the mandate, mandate, like we have been given the mandate. Mm -hmm make sure that you get to see this through. Got it. And, and so what you have mentioned was, um, A, there will be accountability. Uh, B, there will be financial resources behind it. And, and we, you'll be looking at the speed and the quality, and then going down, which as you said, the most important thing is the governance, which the most, you know, again, accreditation, facility, <coughs> student enrollment, um, all of that is, you're absolutely right. That's what we are looking to, uh, in collaboration, to uh, work together to get there. And the bottom line is that, um, as you said, 20 years from now, we look back and we said, uh, we did something very special. Uh, we created a polytechnic that is thriving, is doing very well, and that um, we have answered to our governor and to the legislators that they want to see more STEM. And at the end of the day, our kids to be able to get jobs. Okay, so is there, um, is there a question before I go to the uh, President Genshef? Um Governor Husseini, I would like to ask that um, the third item of Campus Vision Master Plan be uh, uh, set in the agenda next because the update on the search for regional chancellor uh, we're, we're at, uh, 
Is he here? Oh, my assistant, my chief of staff, is at the airport picking up the consultant, and I'd like to to have a full discussion with uh, Mr. Funk here as well. Okay. So if that's okay with Absolutely. you, could we um, come back to my agenda item following the Campus Vision Master Plan? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so let's go to Campus Vision and um, Master Planning, and we go to Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, my end now. Okay. <clears throat> Am I right? Well, oh, actually, well, Mr. Touchstone, I'm sorry. Have yes, go ahead. David, Thank you. Um, I'm going to repeat for the record, my name is David Touchton. I'm a CPA who's practiced in Polk County, born in Polk County, has lived in Polk County except for the time of the service all his life. Um, I was selected as this interim CEO position when I went on the campus, and I, today is my ninth day. Um, I, I want to make sure of the environment. And, and to me, it looked a little bit like when I purchased companies and I purchased a number of CPA firms over my life to make sure everybody was doing their job, knew what their job was, and make sure that we were providing the educational opportunity that is our main mission. Uh, and I want to make sure that the faculty was comfortable and they had an environment that was comfortable for them to do their jobs and as well as the staff. So I started out by meeting with uh, a lot of the key staff and knowing this charge of meeting the benchmarks, and, and again, thank you, it, it really took a burden this, uh, off of us to provide the benchmarks. Uh, anytime you do a strategic plan, you start with establishing the goals and benchmarks, and we got that, and we're happy about that. So I sat down with uh, Dr. Payne, who will be up here in a minute and speak to you, and they had already put together their committees, uh, and I wanted to find that. And I'm going to start here, but we have what we call an action team, and each action team is addressing one of the set of benchmarks. And those also, when those benchmarks or the, the goals are set, the action steps are set, they will work on achieving those action steps. And when they achieve them, we hope that they will achieve the benchmarks. <coughs> now, each action team is a member of what we call the transition team. Now the transition team vets a lot of the issues. We've had our third meeting since I got there and we're doing it with a lunch that I'm providing and then meeting for an hour and a half. And uh, Dr. Payne will show you, I'm a little bit surprised. I figured it would take 90 days to develop the action steps. I think we've got it. And I, I, I want y'all's input on it because I look at y'all as partners. That's Very simply, me. partners. I look at USF as a partner. But one of the things I wanted to make sure of, because it was in the press, that we had the proper mix on these committees. And I mean having the faculty, having the staff, and having the students. And we actually have a few community leaders on these committees. And in fact, we realized, because we had a campus-wide meeting, that maybe we needed more faculty on the transition team. So. Yesterday, we added two more oh, faculty me. members. I get you covered. I get you uh, covered. Please mute your phone. Sorry, Mr. Touchstone. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> if you don't mind me stopping. So we added two more. We are going to be inclusive on these committees. I told everybody <laughs> we're going to live in today and tomorrow. We've got a job to do. We need to continue educating our students, but we also have these benchmarks to meet. I think that we have got the, the proper process in place, and I'm a process person. We actually communicated this in a campus-wide meeting Tuesday. I uh, am told it's the first meeting, campus-wide meeting, where we had people standing. There was not enough seating. And it was the longest one because we did have a lot of questions. And we concluded the meeting with, if you feel like you didn't get your question answered, come see us. And I've actually got a point with one person, already met with them, and they're the ones that said, you need more faculty, and we've done it. So I think we're communicating well. Now, any of these work sessions we have, we're going to try to publicize them, and we've been trying to make sure that we are transparent, and we're communicating every Friday an email which, by the way, the poly board, campus board, chair is getting. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's up to him to forward it. Um, you're invited. 
The only thing I ask is let us know so we can make sure you got something to eat. I am not one that likes to miss a lunch. <laughs> but I would like for you to really get down and look at what we've done and I would like to introduce our regional vice chairman of academics and the chair of the transition committee, Dr. Payne. <coughs> Just for the record, I'm uh, James Payne, uh, Regional Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Research. And okay. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Chancellor Brogan, President Genshaft, and the uh, members of the Board of Governors uh, Task Force and the Board of Trustees Oversight Committee. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is dovetail into what Dr., uh, Mr. Touchens stated in terms of what we're trying to do to give you a context is trying to be inclusive with all the stakeholders, both the community as well as we look at faculty, staff, and students in terms of moving forward. And so just be mindful of that. They were very, very aware of the questions about governance surrounding the campus. Um, since I've been here for six months, I started in July. But what I want to do is go through and maybe highlight and maybe, maybe get in the weeds a little bit of what we've been doing just to let you know how hard people have been working, you know, again, across the faculty and staff in particular. And, we do have student participation in a number of committees. Let me ask you this. Are you in, you're in, um, are you out of Tampa or are you in Lakeland? I'm, I'm the regional vice chancellor for academic affairs oh, okay. and research at USF Polytechnic. In, at Polytechnic, yes. okay. Um, as, as David mentioned, we have five um, action teams. We have a transition uh, committee. Um, the chairs of the action teams are part of the transition committee. And as David mentioned, we meet twice a week over lunch for about an hour and a half. And the thing to remember about this transition is, as I'm sure you understand, even though we have five action committees or teams, we can, you know, semantics here, uh, but they're really integrated uh, because you, a decision made in one committee will affect another committee. So we have to meet as a group to make sure we're all on the same page. And so we're being efficient in our time and utilization of resources going forward. So what I'd like to do is maybe start, I'm chairing, although I'm chairing the overall act, uh, transition committee, I'm also head of the academic program development. As you know, in the BOG directive and the benchmark stated there, it's at phase one of the business plan, there are 16 programs stated there. And so I'm in charge of making sure that those program proposals are completed in a timely fashion and vetted through the USF system to the Board of Governors. Uh, so let me give you a context here, and I'll, I might be talking for a little while here, so, but I think it's very important that you understand how much work has been done. Um, uh, on December 14th, I met with uh, Provost Ralph Wilcox of the um, USF system. Uh, we met in part, we wanted to get a feel for my vision moving forward for the, for the campus. Um, and also we had a discussion on how we want to manage this, uh, this transition. Uh, initially, I had suggested, I think, seven to eight committees. We had agreement of coming in with five, uh, having a chair, and ranging from five to seven members on the committees to make it more manageable logistically to have meetings and so forth. Um, so we have an agreement there. Uh, we also, the big question when you look at the, um, the benchmarks is STEM. As you know, there's a lot of definitions of STEM, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that the National Science Foundation is here on campus because we decided, uh, Provost Wilcox and I agreed, that we should be documenting STEM in terms of the classification, FD, enrollment, and so forth, based on the NSF definition of STEM. Uh, so we're in agreement there. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so that was important because a lot of what we're going to Can we receive a copy of that, please? Yes. That definition of the yeah, STEM? Most definitely. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I want to, before we go into more detail here, I want to also give you a point of reference. I know you're always wanting benchmarks, a reference point. Um, uh, as of then the fall 2011, our FTE, because I know a lot of, the, several of the benchmarks are tied to FTE, our FTE is 901, 901 students, or FTE. Uh, based on the NSF definition of STEM, we have 25%, okay, okay. enrollment in STEM at this point in time. How many? 25%. 25%. Okay. The other issue that you're probably wondering in light of uh, the events in um, the past semester, <laughs> this transition to spring semester, uh, so in spite of these events, there has been a 5.4% increase 
in spring enrollment relative to the previous year's spring. So 2012 spring enrollment is 5%, a little over 5% higher than spring of 2011. So it's a good sign in light of, as you know, there's been a lot of media attention put on USF Polytechnic. Um, so that was, it was good to see. Could I, could I ask a question, Mr. Sure. Chairman? I didn't know if we were allowed to, yes. to interrupt with questions yes, or, or wait. Um, just a clarification, uh, probably for everyone, just a reminder, I guess, is that you currently are sharing facilities in many cases uh, with, with the college. Uh, with Polk State Polk college. State. It has the increased enrollment uh, given you any particular challenges based on the shared facilities uh, over time? Because that's an issue that we're obviously going to have to deal with as this thing grows and builds and we morph into new facilities, et cetera. Right, right. Is always remembering where we are today and how we get where we're going. So. Well, I think right now in the short run, I think we're trying to do, be more, more uh, efficient in terms of classroom space, in terms of scheduling of courses without Generally, a lot of our students are nighttime students, but we're seeing more students as we move towards a uh, freshman, sophomore class, more day students. So we're utilizing, I think, the facilities more efficiently. But in, in their term, as we, as you'll see in some of the programs, in addition to hiring faculty, we're going to have to, and I've already, uh, Alice Murray, if I already talked uh, with Polk State in terms of utilizing some of their, uh, their lab space. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. As we grow, there's going to be additional physical space needs and so forth in terms of, of the courses themselves. But you're in pretty good shape today. Right now, <laughs> cross my fingers, <laughs> we're in good shape. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Tom? How many uh, total students does the uh, 901 FTEs equal, total students? Oh, well, we're at, in terms of the head count, do you have one? The IPEDS report, this is Judith Ponicell, the okay. Regional Vice Chancellor Assessment and Accountability at USF Polytechnic. Well, that's um, a business card waiting for a place. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, IPEDS report that was submitted for the 2010-2011 data was 1,683, what are defined as our own campus students. Okay, 1,683. So that's uh, one and a half to one kind of so there's a good bit of full-time students as opposed to just uh, part-time students. Correct. Uh, right. We also serve, <coughs> in addition to that, uh, another about 1,500 students who are part-time and who come from multiple campuses, take courses with us, and so forth. So, so the 1,683 are full-time students? Those are, those are our students that have designated USF Polytechnic as their home campus. Okay, good. All right, good. Uh, you know, um, um, and, I'm, and after this, I'm just going to let you finish your report before we ask questions. So, but with that said, is uh, I think it'd be a great idea um, to give you an example. Um, when you said you have 25 percent of STEM, when I was uh, looking at the report before we came to our, our board meeting last time. Um, that I received was that it showed that the percentage of STEM was only 8%. And what you have, what you're saying is you have 25%. So um, I think it'd be a great to have a dashboard of all this information. You know, if you can, by our next meeting, say we have so many full-time FTE, we have so many um, females, so many male, we have, give us a dashboard of what do we have. Um, so, um, Mr. Touchstone, that'd be great. Um, thank you so much. Yes. So um, we're going to let you finish your report and okay. don't want to interfere. And I just want to introduce uh, Michael Long, um, our trustee um, student. Welcome back. Uh, welcome. And uh, since you're late, you're buying lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I apologize. I was rear ended this morning on the way over here. So that's a great excuse. Yeah. That's what happens with oh. like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you say rear ended? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tico hand him a card. <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go back. We'll uh, shift back to STEM now, I guess. Yeah. You see, that's what I. That's what I thought. So we we're going to let you finish your. Yeah. Your well, uh, and to uh, I just want to give you some context of where okay. we are because usually it's a question that comes up uh, as a point of reference. Um, as, as Mr. Tushin mentioned, um, we formed a, a transition committee, and then we have action teams or action committees. Or there's five of them, and let me go through the five uh, 
committee. So we have an academic program development, which I'm uh, chairing as well, accreditation, enrollment planning slash student transition, facilities, and administrative services. Um, and so what I want to do is talk really about four of those five. I'm going to uh, return the, uh, the mic, so to speak, over to Mr. Touchton to talk about facilities um, on the, uh, at that point. As Mr. Tunchin mentioned, we've had several of the chairs of those committees, we've had several meetings already. Uh, and right now we're, we're doing twice a week we have meetings because uh, it's very important to make sure everybody's on the same page going forward and it's very important to vet any issues that are coming across committees so we're, it's integrated. Um, as Mr. Tunchin mentioned, we had a campus-wide meeting uh, this past Tuesday. Um, I called the meeting. And part of the, me calling the meeting was to provide information to all the stakeholders on campus. It was, as you mentioned, well attended. Um, and, and an overview was really the composition of the, trans uh, the transition action committees, um, as well as a charge given to each of the committees. And the charge is really aligns with the, the benchmarks that you have, have given us. Okay. Uh, in response, as Mr. Touchin mentioned, we added two at-large faculty members to the transition committee itself, uh, which is made up of the chairs of the committee. So again, we're trying to be as transparent as possible um, in terms of how we move forward. Now, going more into the weeds, uh, in terms of, let uh, me give you some idea of the timelines in which we're going to be working these uh, academic program proposals that were outlined. Uh, and just to reiterate, on the phase one, there's 16 programs. and they're a combination of bachelor's, master's degrees, some of which are integrated programs, meaning their bachelor's streamed into the master's programs or almost a joint degree program. But also the fact that these programs within, this, within the system, SIP code classification, are rel relatively unique. Okay. Um, so let me go through 2012-2013. Um, and these are the programs, and I'll tell you, talk a little bit more about the tasks that I've charged the faculty in terms of developing them and going more to the point of uh, Mr. Lamb's point of accountability and oversight to make sure we proceed in a timely fashion. So uh, we have the BS in Accounting and Financial Management. Uh, the BS-MS slash MBA, I know it sounds like a mouthful, but it's really looking at within the College of Technology Innovation, integrating people from various disciplines in IT, engineering, and business coming together, I mean, going through the respective undergraduate degree, but also moving out into a master's degree and having some overlap in course coverage so they can finish in a timely fashion. And I think it's very unique within the state university system. A BS in informatics, MS in informatics, a BS in systems engineering, MS in systems engineering. Um, also, we're gonna be developing a joint BS, MS in dietetics and nutritional science, MS in integrated STEM education, a BS in Law Enforcement Science and Technology, a BS in Technology Innovation Management, along with an MS in, tech in Technology Innovation Management. So those are the ones that are being developed in this coming year and in, through 2013. In 2014, and these programs are put out to 2014, and I'll uh, mention the issue that we've gone through uh, a lot of, uh, was that a question for me? No, uh, keep going. Please uh, mute your uh, phone, star six. Uh, out to 2014, there, we're going through some uh, hiring that needs to take place. And these programs, an MS in Alternative Energy, a BS in Biological Science, a BS in Digital Design and Technology, a BS in Health Information Technology, and a BS in Software Engineering. Those are the programs that comprise phase one of the business plan as, as documented in your, your benchmarks to us. Now, what I've requested, I guess I'm, I'm uh, Taskmaster, <laughs> you talk to the faculty. Um, I requested, and what I've charged, and what I'm really working on in the spring are the first six I mentioned there. Uh, they really come out of the College of Technology Innovation, and I told the, the committees that every two weeks I want to see a draft of where you are. I will review it, and provide comment. Uh, I'll be working with um, Academic Affairs, Kathleen Moore, Steve Richard, in particular, in terms of any kind of Difficulty that we have, we'll coordinate together. Uh, I think Kathleen's been very generous in, in offering her time to also provide her eyes at, on the um, drafts as they come forward. Because we do want to move it through a timely fashion in terms of getting these programs approved 
realizing we can't actually offer the programs the way you know follow through with SACS, but we want we really don't have them inventoried on the shelf ready to roll out once once uh, we have SACS. Uh, in the short run, I have, could I ask yeah, a sure. question? Sure. When you say inventoried on the shelf, could you give me just a little detail more about what that means? Yeah, what I mean in is in terms of. Tomorrow you could turn it on because you've already got that. Right, right, right. Right now at the phase, the 16 programs I mentioned, faculty are developing the program proposals. They will have to go through the campus undergraduate, graduate curriculum committees, and then move forward to the, the, through the USF system to the Board of Governors. Okay. Uh, once they're approved, we can't offer those programs until we meet the sex. Accreditation standards. Right. Um, so when I mean in the interim there, when it, bad language on my part is inventory, they're there waiting to be launched once we have their accreditation. May I? Uh, just for point of clarification, sure. Mr. Chairman, because some of this gets very confusing, and I don't mean that to talk down to anybody. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it is confusing for everyone. If you recall, there's really two stages of accreditation we're talking about for the Polytech. Number one is the statutorily required accreditation status that comes along with them ultimately becoming uh, an, a, a separate accredited institution as a part of the University of South Florida. Once established there, then it is a move toward the second step in accreditation, which is to become an independent institution by Southern Association accreditation status. The, the uh, complexity here, however, is that once you've started down a path of accreditation with Southern Association, remember the first one is to become a separately accredited uh, branch of the University of South Florida, you cannot significantly change things like governance structure, you cannot significantly change things like academic program until you've secured that first accreditation status. Once you've done that, and that is the point being made, uh, you can then move on to a new program array. So uh, it is important to recognize that as excited as everybody is about increasing the STEM load uh, in the short term, uh, the first obligation under the benchmarks established by the Board of Governors and through the accreditation process is to maintain what is currently happening. But there's two ways to do that. One is not to begin to build the new program array until you've achieved that status. The other is the path being taken, which is to begin now to build that new program array, uh, uh, begin to add faculty who are able to navigate both current array and new program array, so that as soon as that first accreditation status is secured, there is no time loss to immediately implement the inventory of programs that are being put on the shelf for that turnaround. Is that a fair? That's uh, very fair. And I'll, I'll, well, let me add layman's another. perspective on it. Could, well, could, I, could I ask, Mr. Chairman, sure. is it possible for us to have an ongoing report that would show the actions, the timeline, and so that we can be constantly updated? Yeah, that's what we will be getting. Updated on that. So we, we, we have that in writing and we see. Every quarter. What's going on, and if, yeah. and if we're missing it, we're aware very early that we've got a problem and we can address it. They're going to be aware of it, and we're going to be aware of it. You got it. That's the transparency we talked about in the dashboard, for lack of a better term, right. that should include those milestones uh, and updates. And some of them will be able to quantify, but there will be some that are hard, that you need to qualify. We need to just share them with you in writing in terms of an update. So. You'll, you'll get both. I just wanted to provide also a little bit of clarification. When USF Poly started at, as a campus, it started in education and mainly and in business. So it didn't have the programs that we're talking about right now, which are really important, and they're the technology programs. So what, along with your, your request, will be new faculty hires that are qualified to teach uh, some of the different STEM uh, programs, <laughs> program, STEM programs that you've outlined. So it's not just um, being able to offer them right away. We have to make sure that the faculty are there with the qualifications to teach those courses. So let, we let, can, me, let me tie it in, not to uh, Chancellor 
Rogan's point and President Genshaft, you know, one thing um, that we're also doing in the short run um, and to, addr to address the enrollment in STEM is that we, we currently have industrial engineering and information technology. What I've charged uh, the faculty engineering and information technology is looking at informatics, which is being developed in systems engineering, which are, is going to have concentrations within those areas, is go ahead and start developing content areas or elective clusters within industrial engineering and information technology. Uh, so students can start enrolling in those, and then once those programs are launched, they can trans in transition into informatics or systems engineering if they so desire. Uh, the other thing to look at is developing um, a charge to look at new concentrations in the BSAS programs, the Bachelor of Science in Applied Science, to align again with con content areas that align with the systems engineering and, inform and information technology uh, programs that we're going to, uh, excuse me, informatics programs we're developing. So we're, we're taking steps. We realize the timing issue. Uh, and the reason I want them to start developing the concentrations is, is what President Genshaf mentioned. One thing I'm going to be meeting with the division directors over the next few weeks, hopefully next week if we can do the scheduling the week after, is that we're going to have to coordinate a hiring plan. We, we have uh, faculty in place, but it, we're going to go through the programs and line them up as where, where we have gaps. And also be mindful, especially in terms of using state resources, that one thing is a polytechnic, you really uh, foster interdisciplinary uh, interaction with faculty is that we're going to be looking at faculty that can maybe be serving dual purposes across disciplines. Um, so as we develop this, we're hiring faculty, we want to make sure that they're teaching but also generating the enrollment but also that those faculty that are hired also have the expertise for the programs that are going to be launched once we go through the approval process. So we're, we're taking some intermediary steps to not just be dormant, but to be proactive in terms of being. Uh, and and, and if I might, threat. not to belabor this, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, but this is this issue of accreditation is is completely important throughout this entire process. It is the common thread that ties together the current status of the the campus, the second uh, level status, uh, which is the day that uh, the campus achieves that first level of new accreditation. Uh, and then the third as an independent, uh, because back to the students, Governor uh, Long, uh, every student now and going forward always needs to know that they will be attending a fully accredited institution. It is today under the auspices of the University of South Florida. It will be when it achieves separate accreditation uh, status as a campus of the University of South Florida, albeit a bit different. And it will be then as it achieves the ultimate accreditation as a, a separate and independent institution. And that's pivotal for the faculty we have, the faculty we will hire, but especially for students to know as they look to maintain and ultimately join uh, the, the, the uh, institution going forward. And so you'll hear about that accreditation because it is really the common thread in the motion approved by the Board of Governors. The metrics are, are all critical to this, but at the end of the day, it is that consistent attention to the accreditation status as this thing evolves that will keep it tied together. Fair assessment. And, and you <coughs> cannot have financial aid for students without accreditation. You, it, it's, um, and also uh, the ability to get federal grants without a, a, an accreditation um, a number. So those are two very, very right. important. I, I'm, I'm very impressed, but I want to make sure he's, I, I heard it right. So you're looking to hire uh, faculties that not only they're qualified for today, these programs, but they're also qualified for tomorrow's program. Right. Am I correct? Well, that's what we're trying to do in terms of creating these concentrations. Um, uh, so we're getting, you know, just hiring faculty and not utilizing them at full capacity, right. I think, is, is not a prudent use of, of resources. So Very that's good. why we want to flush out. Uh, the concentration, the elective clusters. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, Can I, ask a, I guess my question is, are we, are we making sure that we're not doing a shotgun approach, that, that we're going to pick out two or three areas mm -hmm. that we believe we can achieve within the period of time <clears throat> and concentrating on that yeah. so that we don't have right. 
too much going on and that we can focus. You yeah, know. yeah. The, the, the task, uh, you know, basically the, the direction that gave, gave the uh, the campus wide meeting and and uh, division directors and faculty is, you know, a priority. For instance, in the hiring plan is phase one programs. Where do we have any gaps that we need to fill with development of those programs? We also want to make sure, given that we're transitioning from a two-year junior, senior level institution and masters to freshman, sophomore, we got to make sure that we have complete coverage in general education, <coughs> and also along in both those categories, be compliant with SACS credentialing. So, so it's very focused, uh, and that's been communicated to everybody. Um, so, yeah. So we're not. It's not all of a sudden someone has an idea. We're going to start this program over here. No. Um, we have the business plan I did. I will say that I did encourage some some faculty who were really excited about their programs, which I don't want to stifle faculty um, excitement. Uh, I encouraged them to go ahead and start, you know, I gave them the template and so forth, start developing their programs. But again, the priority is the first 16 that are laid out in phase one uh, that we have to meet. But I want them to go ahead if they're gun ho I don't want to I don't want to squash your spirit and if I might mr. chairman to emphasize that and uh, governor Tripp was the chair of a board that had multiple campuses large campuses um, key to all of this is going to be to avoid what I call the song of the sirens which is every time someone thinks it's a good idea to add one more program you mm -hmm. do and run the risk of ultimately becoming an inch deep and a mile wide mm -hmm. where it's hard for students to get enough sections it's hard to finish your degree in a timely fashion and then the realization that this is not a tr headed toward a traditional branch campus approach mm -hmm. this is headed toward a very focused approach mm -hmm. and therefore just your question is is very critical to the future of this maintaining a focus on the curriculum and the program array that's developed. That's what will ultimately separate a polytech from a traditional branch campus. And so it's going to be very important that that, that occur. And, and I'm suggesting based on your approach, it is. Uh, I'm not questioning that. I think it gets back to Trustee Lamb's issue of, uh, of quality. Uh, you, uh, to maintain focus and have the discipline to do that, even though people might be trying to pull you back over time toward a more traditional branch campus approach, is going to be pivotal to make sure that this is not just a polytech in name and even an accredited polytech, but a very focused and disciplined approach toward this niche market that a polytech is meant to serve. Uh, Governor Beard, you had a question. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, and it may be premature in your presentation, but the timeline. I mean, we talk about uh, going ahead and getting, uh, going through the process. My guess is that it's going to be really critical to this committee that the timelines are developed in a pragmatic way and that we don't try to hurry beyond where we ought to ought to be hurrying uh, right. to get this done because there's going to be a lot of pressure to get it done quickly and yet to do it right it's going to take longer time periods and just the yeah I, I agree with you I mean one, one um, again how we're how we're phasing out the programs how they're being developed um, initially in the, this coming spring there's six and it's it's those six are going to the forefront and one because they're centered around technology and innovation at that college, but the fact is that uh, we have a critical number of faculty in place that have the knowledge base to develop the programs. But the accreditation time timeline, which is, as you said, the critical one, how long will that take? I mean, are we well, talking five I was, years? I was going to go through years? this, but I, at this point I'd like to, to defer to my colleague, okay. Judith Ponicell, if you time wanted time. to, because it, it does vary a little bit. Yeah. Is that a fair yeah. statement, Judith? That's a fair. That's a fair statement. Um, Judith, for purposes of the microphone, I hate to make you. Did you come to the front of the class? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> the front presentation. Well, I need to drag my boxes over with the front of the class. Right. So Just talk louder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Judith, I don't know what it is. Every time a, a tough question comes up, you know. He turns to you for answer. Let's <laughs> <laughs> call teamwork. Uh, Judith, you want me to go ahead and throw out a, a date? And I, don't want <laughs> I received a request from President Genshaft that I do a working, working 
working draft, I think was the terminology, that was an update of our SACS application. So that as much as possible, we would have... This is just book one. This is... Uh, no, I, 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 I was looking for a day. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll, give you, I'll give you a perspective on that. Thanks. A part that I have an example for part. Okay. Yeah. Does everybody get this down that way? No. Yeah. So, um, for the people on the on the call, uh, we have just received a book, couple of hundred page deep, that it says working draft one, uh, uh, SACS application for um, um, no. for membership. And and we're not handing out part two, but if this is part two of the materials as well. No, that's then, only part two of one, part one. Oh, okay. so I think we, that, that's we, we, we got, got the message. They get it. They get it. They get it. I, think, I, think there's, I think there's several important components, so let me address, first of all, the request that the president made in terms of an updated SACS application. SACS application was submitted in December 2010. So that means by this particular point in time, some significant information that SACS is usually interested in has changed. So enrollment, um, assessment information, we have this group that has been formed, we have the action of the Board of Governors. Those are not things that SACS likes to be surprised about. So to do an update of our current application, what's required is to go through the previous application and bring it up to finishing out 2011. So, you know, 2010, 2011 academic year. So that as close as possible, they are up to date on what has transpired up through fall 2011. This particular draft um, incorporates as much as conceivably possible um, from the space of Thursday last week to Tuesday this week. So it is a working, 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 working initial draft. In addition to that, there are 14 of these because SACS requires hard copy documentation for every single reference that is made in there. So 14 of these, if you lay them out in reading fashion, is about 18 feet. There are 600 pages in each of these. So that's about an 8,000 page report. And when I mailed the shorter version in December 2010, it was 130 pounds of paper. <laughs> that said, the campus takes very seriously separate, separate accreditation. The SACS <laughs> leadership team, which is comprised of faculty and staff, and then the action team that is comprised of four faculty and a student. That SACS leadership team has met monthly, sometimes more frequently than that, for the last year and a half as we have completed the SACS application, but then also worked on what's the next piece. Because once you have the application accepted and you're approved to go forward, then you have what's called the compliance certification. And the compliance certification are all of the comprehensive standards that did not have to be addressed in the application. So we weren't just sitting, waiting to hear from SACS. We've been on that documentation for those comprehensive standards. In a potential scenario, uh, an update of an application, and President Fenshaft, I'll leave it to you to discuss the conversation that you had with uh, President Whelan at SACS. <clears throat> but in an update of that, an update could conceivably be created to go out the door by April 1st. But now let's talk about how SACS works. SACS makes it very clear in their guidelines and in their policies that it could take them 12 to 18 months to simply review all of these materials. And that's understandable because they primarily have one reviewer who reviews all of this. Once you have all of the materials reviewed, 
they provide feedback as to whether or not this is something that they accept and are willing to bless you to go forward, or whether or not they have some questions that have to be answered first. So let's take the um, short frame because it's easier for me to count in years than it is to count in a year and a half. If it took SACS a year to review the application, then we might expect feedback from them somewhere around June 2012. Then you have a window, a year to actually two years, before you schedule a site visit. But you also have to remember that the further out you are in scheduling, that's all the updating that has to be done in order to continue to move that document forward. It's a very iterative process. In the shortest time frame, if they responded, let's say June 2012, and we were able to look at about a year before scheduling a site visit, it would probably be early, early, um, oh, maybe fall 2012 later, early spring 2013. Once the site visit occurs, the team is pretty good about turning around a response in 30 days, but then you have five months and you are required to take the five months to do a response to their response. So we wouldn't get a response in to SACS if we were, let's say, early spring semester 2013, probably until August-ish, 2013. 13 or 14? I thought we were... Oh, 14, 14, sorry. 14. 14, 14. you're right, I lost a year. Yeah. So if we get a response in August 2014, it is very conceivable that at SACS's December 2014 meeting, they could make a determination. But if SACS takes longer, it would more, most likely be either the June 2015 or the December 2015, which actually is the latest target window that the campus has always had. And that is the goal of the campus has always been to be accredited at the point in time we are on the new campus site. And if that first class is expected in fall 2015, and if we can be accredited in that semester, then we have met what has been the campus's long-term term goal. But only SACS knows, only SACS knows even with the update of the application whether or not that will be fine for them or whether or not they say, you know, we're just going to wait until everything is completed and you can resubmit from there. Only SACS knows what SACS will do. But I would say that kind of 2015 year, somewhere in there to be accredited, would be a relatively fair, and, and, fair and guess. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, and just for purposes of clarification, we talked about the two accreditation cycles. Let's be clear on what That's we're talking about by way of the, the, again, the date was. So let's say, let's generally say December, December 2015, yes. generally. What occurs then is then a substantive change has to be. That would be the first accreditation. That's the first. The, so you have the first accreditation, then you have a substantive it's a campus, change. USF. USF campus. Polytechnic separately accredited right. regional campus. Right. Right. And you have a substantive change that has to be submitted, but the substantive change doesn't get submitted until the Board of Governors is satisfied that we have met the criteria for independence. So we function as USF Polytechnic, separately accredited regional campus, like our sister campuses in St. Petersburg and Sarasota, Manatee. It's not until the Board of Governors has determined that they are satisfied and that we are approved as a 12th university, then comes the question of, now you have a substantive change simply because now you got a whole different governance structure. And it's an action on USF's part as well, because they have to notify SACS that USF Polytechnic is no longer part of the USF system. So just for point of clarification, Mr. Chair, um, the, the governance does change because, of course, in our system, when you become a completely separate and independent institution, you have uh, your own board, board of trustees. 17, oh, excuse me, you're 17, but you have your full board of trustees, 
uh, appointments by the Board of Governors, appointments by the Governor's Office, a more robust board based on volume, roles, responsibilities change uh, based on the governance model, et cetera. So that would have to take place after the Board of Governors gives uh, sanction to the initial accreditation status for complete independence. Yeah. That's and, and then they would file for their independent SACS accreditation, and that would take how long? According to the policy on substantive change, if you have that level of change of governance, it can take five years. It can take five years. However, Ann Chard, when she had had a conversation, said that that might not necessarily have to take that long for us. I would think it would be faster, but the policy says yeah. five years. Much faster. I would think. Sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. Well, um, uh, Trustee Lamb and I had a conversation with the president of the Southern Association, the SACS, and um, her timeline basically was it would be uh, if we submitted the update, which we would right away, because that's what, mm -hmm. what we're doing right mm -hmm. now, is mm -hmm. to show you that we're done, and, and, and it should be submitted within a week or so, I would think, don't well, you think? Well, I would think we could, we could do it in I would say okay. Um, uh, Kathleen Moore is our guru of all accreditation across the system, and we've been very <laughs> successful with uh, USF St. Pete and USF Sarasota Manatee. So we and, and USF Tampa and USF Tampa, all with um, one maybe, but very few recommendations for changes. So. She knows how to do it right, but with with the two to uh, when we had the conversation, mm -hmm. President Whelan said, with uh, with her staff around, said it would probably be about, as soon as we turn it in, it would probably take about two to three years, and then uh, af and this is about as fast as it can go under this structure, and there isn't if you change structures, it would even take longer. But under this structure, it's the fastest it can move, correct? Right, and that was and just, to, I like yeah. what you're doing, Chancellor Brogan, is to clarify that two to three years that Dr. Whelan, President Whelan for sex, that was on the first right. accreditation. And so, you know, And then the, the second one could move quite quickly, I would think, within the year. But, but interestingly, so people don't, because the, the, the nagging fear I have is that people will believe that by approaching it this way, by going after the initial accreditation as the current statute calls for, mm -hmm. somehow elongates this process. Even Sachs suggested that by doing it this way, you're probably going to have a faster route it is the to fastest. independent university status than it if you didn't fastest. do it this way. Right. So some have suggested that perhaps you should go right for independent uh, oh, accreditation status. Oh, no, then you become status. unaccredited immediately and you, you're on you, for sure a five-year track. Absolutely. You, yes. A, are unaccredited automatically, mm -hmm. not good, and B, you have elongated the track that it is going to take you to get to full independent accreditation status. So that's a very important set of points that have to be made. And the only reason I would, and uh, this is Brian Lamb, uh, the, Chancellor Sandy, the only um, Chair Sandy, the only reason I highlight that what you just articulated is that's not speculation. We didn't, as a committee, assume that or, or reach outside of our own knowledge and capabilities. We did reach out, and, and I want to commend President Ginshaw to President Whelan and say, let us take you through a couple of scenarios, and I want you to answer the questions. With the, with the foundation of how can we accelerate the process. So quite honestly, our intent was to a little bit challenge the process and say, is there, is there a way for us to accelerate achieving the benchmark of accreditation under a couple of scenarios? And we came up with some that aren't as popular as, as anyone would like, but ultimately where we landed after an hour and a half conversation was exactly what Chancellor Brogan just articulated, which is if I had to make a recommendation it was stay the course uh, and, and achieve the it's campus the accreditation. Right. And, then, and then shortly thereafter, there's a pretty good comfort level that you would subsequently, with Board of Governors approval, be able to get your independent accreditation. Um, um, I, I, I'd like to add something here. Um, uh, between the, um, what we like at the next meeting, if you would 
um, crystallize that for us? Because you think it's going to take one year, you think it may take up to five years. And I think that's so important um, uh, for us to know and um, um, that w w what, are, what are we really looking at? Right. Um, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I said Professor. two to three years for the first accreditation. Okay. Then after that, it would probably be a year. Right. Now, so she said that after that could take up to five years. Right. After that's, that. that's the language in their substantive change policy, but they see us as an unusual case. Right. Okay. Because so we have the legislation, we have the Board of Governors action that is driving, five driving years that total. process. Five so years total. five years total, total. total process. Okay, right. you're saying so it's five years right. total, total. Right. not uh, five initial years. Initial right. substantive right. change, oh, okay. separate accreditation. Right. right. Well, because so everybody thought, thought, it, I okay. thought yeah. said five but, years. No, no, no. In addition? No, no, no. In addition, no. that's what, yeah. Yeah. So it's a five year. Years total, five so year, like a five-year window. Right. Exactly. So this is 2012. Right. You think there is a chance? Let me be clear. There is a chance we can get that by December of 2014. Yes. There is a chance. You said a that. Chance. Right. There is a no, chance. It was 15. It was 14. 14. No, there's a chance if it no, takes, no, no. She if said it takes 14. two years. Yes. If, if we're on the scenario that Dr. Whelan provided, right. at, at the shortest, if it takes shortest. two years, that's 2014. Yes. If it takes three, that's 2015. 15. If, but it's up to them. They're the one that make that right. decision. That's correct. If do do that's it quick, if it if it be 14, right. and if they want to look at some more, it, it'll be 15. Correct. So um, so somewhere between 14 to 15. Correct. Right. In addition to that, there there will be. Um, one to two years additional, it depends when it is, mm -hmm. to get the ind university independence. That's to get the accreditation. To get the substantive change But file. they've still got to meet the goals. That's correct. Our goals, and that, oh, that's I understand the second that. question. That's How yes. long is it going to take to meet the goals? Okay, we'll get there. Let me, let's yeah. just talk about, you know, so as far as the SAC's concerned, I think this is a very important question. Um, as far as the SAC's concerned, uh, and this is very important, and again, we like for you to really crystallize it for us at the next meeting. Very important. That you say, we talked to them again, we were very clear with them, we even met with them maybe. So uh, at, at, it's not a telephonic, it's, we sat around the table and we said, this is it, how fast can you get us there? Sure. And, and they said, maybe 14, maybe 15, and what does it take for us? to be an in, assuming the board agree and mm -hmm. all good, and we have the students, and we have, how long more would it take to get it? So is you're it, looking for two significant dates. That's One correct. is the initial accreditation as a regional <coughs> campus at that's the University correct. of South Florida. The second is the accreditation as an independent university of the state university system. That's correct. So, so I assume that, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the day, let's say, that we get the approval for the, uh, the second stage. That's the day we all sit at the table, handshake, they have their new own, new board, and they're on their way. Am I correct? Yeah. It, yes, it, 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 if they meet the rest. Yeah, yeah absolutely, I, I, I'm assuming as, as I mentioned. Right, We're and ready. insert here, using this methodology, any change in this methodology could potentially set back all of the timelines that are being discussed, and that is critical because SACS does its work largely based on a consistent approach step by step. Alter the governance structure, alter affiliation, alter organizational elements, alter program offerings. There is always the potential that any significant change could alter that time schedule right. and that this appears to be, by all accounts, to be the, the most guess. expeditious route yes. to both of those accreditation staffs. Yes. Uh, President Genchaf, uh, um, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lane, yes. um, I think is, it is huge important for you guys to meet with SACS, mm -hmm. be extremely crystallized this is what the shortest time. I assure you that's very important. Okay. What we don't want to happen is somebody shows up and say, oh, we can get this done in 18 months. Mm -hmm. So I'm just being, you know, mm -hmm. just please, 
to go meet with them face to face, take all of your books, talk to them. We're clear on this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and, and so when you come back three months from now, okay. say, we went, we worked at it, we discussed it, and everything is crystallized. These are the dates. Right. And we really appreciate We'd that. We'd be happy to do that. And, and with that, I'm going to go to Governor Perez and had a question, and he's been sitting here patiently. Not at all. Um, it, it's a broader question, and my predicate is I'm married to an industrial engineer. So that's my predicate to that question. And that is, in my home, when we're going to do anything, there is a project plan on the fridge with critical dates, with critical paths. Do we have an overall project plan to achieve compliance here with all of those critical dates? For instance, if we file this thing a couple of weeks late, we're going to slip six months. Um, when, what triggers what in this process? I think when we were out of the room, did you talk about the project that plan? We talked about that, the dashboard coming with the dates and if, if how is it going to happen. It, so have we seen, I've not seen the project no. plan yet. Is it, uh, it, can it, it's not done yet, is it? No, no. That, okay. That's exactly what we're working that's on. That's what they're working on. Right. Yes. David Tushton is putting together yeah. in his priorities, even the first 90 days, and I don't want to steal your thunder, yeah. but I, right. I just kind of want to answer your question. That was a clear directive from the oversight committee. I would imagine was. so. Yeah, I mean, we, we need to know what those He's going to come are. up with the time frame right. and, and with the goals. And and they are going to be looking at those goals, those dates, and so yeah, what, what and in it, transparency with us. Yeah, exactly. what, what triggered it for me was the hiring of certain faculty in certain areas. And, I, and I'm wondering if hiring faculty over here fits into that plan or if it's making sense. Up. So right. I just want to make sure, yeah. typically, at least in my household, before we start any home projects, that's on the fridge before we do anything. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. So I just wanted to make sure that I had Tico out of bed. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Actually, it's Tico to the gym. gym. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's, it's a great, listen, it's, it's, it's the right question. We talked a little bit about it. I think the takeaway, uh, Governor Perez, was when we come back, we'll be able to share that, but not only show you the project plan, but Governor Tripp was. Are we tracking to it? Right. And so it's, well, we've got to have something to track. Yeah. So it's both. Well, that, I, I think what I take out of this that uh, at, uh, Governor uh, Perez, I feel for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Man when, the plan. When, <laughs> Let the record show. <laughs> yes. By, uh, we will have the uh, timeline crystallized, and we will have everything. We will have met with Sachs, mm -hmm. but by the next uh, meeting, we will have also turned in and finalized, turned in the updated copy so it's done, ready to go, and it'll be ready for them. I mean, the clock ha will have started That's right. by by the next time we meet. Thank you. Mr. Tuskin. Yes, sir. I'm very sensitive to the timelines, and I know they're in the business plan. But what I understand is the business plan was written by a consultant, it was written in a very short period of time. But what I'm sensitive to is any changes to that business plan, we must notify you all. So I really want to get on this timeline very quickly and make sure that you all are alerted if there's any changes. And I don't know that there is. Could I ask a question kind of on that? Um, Dr. Payne, as I see it, is put in the position right now of kind of being the one that's got to make this all happen. And, and my, I guess my question and then concern is, since we are now going, you are now going out to look for a new chancellor of the campus, uh, could you speak just a little bit about when that person comes on board, how we can be assured that this is going to continue? and that we're not going to get a whole new thought process. I have a different way to go. My idea is a better one, because I think that that happens many times, and you're going to bring somebody in, and I would hope that we have that conversation with the consultant and that he's talking to whoever comes on that they've got to kind of buy in to where you've already taken us so we don't get down the road and we're changing directions again. Could you speak uh, to that? Me, can I, you know, maybe, yeah. okay. can you please wait? 
let Dr. Payne finish his uh, presentation uh, because there will be there will be a discussion on that, and, and the consultant will be here. He so is, she's gonna she's he's here. So let him finish finish this item. We have one item specific to that with the consultants and all that. Okay. Well, just uh, some of our other items. Uh, since um, thank you, Judith, for coming to, coming to the plate here with the uh, accreditation. Uh, I'd like to just move to, to expedite things, uh, enrollment planning and student transition. Um, we've been working with the OFS system in terms of uh, current articulation agreements, um, in terms of there's been questions about uh, issues of options for diploma, USF versus USF Polytechnic. Um, we're also developing uh, collaborations with uh, the state college system. Um, in terms of generating a pipeline to address issues in terms of student enroll, uh, enrollment. Um, also, we're not just at the state college, we also have a number of uh, recruitment efforts at the high school level um, as well. Um, and then we also have a number of initiatives with uh, K through 12 um, that we're trying to, to launch to, one, get the idea of a polytechnic out there in terms of a brand. Um, but also, I think, to really try to help K-12 education, uh, STEM education in particular. And we have a number of programs that we're developing there. We have a gifted and talented program, STARS program, uh, that usually are taking place during the summer months. So we're looking at that, the pipeline further down in terms of future recruitment. Uh, we're also developing a, what we call a Summer B Master's of Science Preparation Bridge program that we want to launch in. 2014 during the summer, and it's, it's really trying to transition students from high school into university and focusing more like a math science boot camp to kind of get them uh, focused in on, on the structure of the of what we view for the STEM disciplines. And we're going to be, to mention the accountability piece, we're going to be monitoring each term and, and annually STEM and STEM related headcount credit hour production and FTE. So there will be a report that comes out every at the end of each semester of how we're doing, making progress. Um, the other area I want to, uh, in student transition, as I mentioned, um, uh, Jan Lloyd, who is, is uh, overseas student affairs for USF Polytechnic, met in, on November 23rd uh, with US Tampa Registrar to discuss diploma options for students. Um, process they just notified the fall 2011 graduate students and collected data regarding option preference uh, so they're going to that data right now so if students have a you know there's an issue with students about you know whether or not they want to have USF USF Polytechnic on their diploma um, and so we're in coming weeks uh, there's going to be another discussion following up on the data collection uh, what would be the preferred process providing USF diploma okay. options okay uh, shifting gears on the administrative services, um, this is a, is a catch-all area, as you know, it includes many of the enterprise business systems, the library, a lot of what some people think the back office uh, areas. Um, so we're look, working with, we're going to be working with general counsel to draft agreements between USF and USF Poly for current services. Uh, we're looking at, we're planning to recruit and hire director of financial aid and registrar. Um, I don't have specific timelines on these right now. Uh, with that, we're going to develop new documentation for campus operations regarding financial aid, registrar, admissions, general counsel, finance, human resources, and the library. And we're also going to explore options, and one thing that came up in the business plan is open source systems. Um, and talk about opportunities with open source systems with sister campuses. And we're going to meet with integrators and software providers to evaluate new solutions. And some of those, not to get too much detail, um, is we're going to be looking at the network infrastructure domain management and technology vendor non-student information system agreements to coincide with the construction of the new campus. So we want a lot of the technology to be in sync with the development of the campus itself as we build it out. Um, we're also going to establish new agreements with electronic library services and, and associated technologies. And then, you know, another important aspect is the training of personnel in the new systems um, as, as we move towards uh, the new campus and to towards independent status. And so at this point, I'll turn it back to um, David. And sure. Dr. Payne, we actually have all that written out in detail 
let's make sure we transmit it to both oversight committees. I mean, it's a lot more detail than Dr. Payne went through. And so we will get that to you. That'd be great. And, and we will um, we'll include it on our minutes. Okay. If that's, Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, I really thought when I got on campus that the benchmark that would take the longest was construction. But I begin to believe it's going to be accreditation. But construction is one, <coughs> excuse me, that's been well vetted in the newspapers and there's been a lot of perceptions about it. I wanted to get in and get my hands uh, dirty, so to speak. And at the same time, Trustee Lamb asked uh, Trustee Mitchell if he would look at it. And about that same time, I asked the Poly Board Chair, Gene Engel, to put together what I call a new campus review committee. And this uh, made sure that there was nobody that was currently doing a contract with USF or had been on the contract. And these are architects, these are developers, and these are builders. And we actually had a meeting this past Monday where they went through the plans in detail. We got some follow-up questions. I think they believe it's a workable plan. And at this point, I would like Dr. Murray to bring you up to date on where we are on construction and somewhat of the timeline. And Dr. And Trustee Mitchell, I hope you will supplement her presentation and help her. Actually, would it be all right if I sure. sort of give my sure. report I'm, and then defer to you, the sir? Okay. Sure. Yes, I, would. That's fine. I think my my report is going to turn on your requirement and the Board of Governors' requirement, which was reinforced by Dr. Genshaft and, and our Chairman Ramil uh, when we created the Oversight Committee, and that is, we want this to happen. And so we want to look at everything and to make sure that everything that is told, has been told to us can, in fact, be accomplished. When uh, Chairman Lynn, uh, who is the head of our oversight committee, pointed me to look at the facilities, I was very happy to do so because I've been blessed over the years to be involved with major projects all around the state, and a number of them in Polk County, so I have some familiarity. We have a couple developers, actually probably board developers on the Board of Governors, and you could appreciate what I'm going to tell you. But in going through the nuclear documents that impact us. As of last Friday, actually, Mr. Tushton and I met with the USF Poly team that has handled the negotiations in conjunction with our executive staff at the University of South Florida. I can tell you that the documents that they crafted are superior documents. They're excellent documents. If I, when I tell you all the things that governments are doing, you would be very happy to have one-third of that done on projects that you are trying to develop. It's outstanding with respect to what has been done and willing to, and, and has been accomplished, and this is what I want to report to you. But I looked at the documents for this reason. I looked at it as if I'm representing the new university. I'm going to be the owner of this. What needs to be done, what has been done, has it actually been done? So when I reviewed every document, I looked for backup on every point that was in the contracts to make sure that they were in fact done. And I also looked at any continuing obligations, because of course their continuing obligations at the data transfer, that those obligations would transfer to the new university. So I had to have all that in mind. In going, going through, I started off with the land. And the, and the land is 170 acres. <clears throat> I have a, a handout here that I'll share with you. Let's see if I can pass this around. <coughs> It's 170, it's 170 acres that was basically provided us through a donation agreement by the Williams Group, Williams Acquisition Holdings. And uh, in that document, which is really one of the key documents, the Williams Acquisition Group agreed not only to provide us the land, but to do things that we would be doing, you would be doing as a developer, take care of mitigation responsibilities. And I'm going to pass this around because I want you to take a look, at, first of all, One of the first tab, tab two, if you look at tab two, you'll see a picture of the land as it exists now. Those who haven't seen it, now you know. We're actually under construction through the hard work and efforts of uh, the USF uh, Poly team. So we're, un we're under, under construction. The USF Poly team, by the way, consists, is led by Dr. Alice Murray and has uh, architect John White in-house staff, Pete Caramit Sanis, 
Yeah. Uh, this, 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 this with us. And also they have outside counsel, Tim Campbell. Uh, yeah, they did a very, very superior job as well as your assistant, Claire. And uh, they were a great source of information for me. Last Friday was the first time that actually Mr. Touchton and I touched the dirt. And since that time, they have been tremendously responsive for every request that I've made. I've read every single document. I've read over a thousand pages. Matter of fact, I'm so happy that Chairman Lamb didn't put me on the SACS committee. <laughs> you realize that. 19 feet of files. <laughs> I'd have two glasses for sure. <laughs> but but in, but in any event, uh, I've gone through very thoroughly all those documents and I'll report them to you. The project itself initially, the land itself was initially part of the Williams DRI, which is the second uh, item, it's uh, tab three which will give you a picture of the land plan for the Williams project. Our property is, is identified as USF campus, is that little horseshoe crab-like <coughs> figure up in the, uh, basically the northeast corner of that, right at the intersection of Interstate 4 and the Polk, uh, uh, Polk Parkway. What they did is that this was already a DRI in works. They moved forward and removed the DRI, removed this property, the USF property from the DRI. And I have documentation to support that that you'll see in your file, which is actually the next one. There's a notice of adoption of amendment. Basically, they have a new legal description. The new legal description effectively removed, you know, our 170 acres. The next thing that they've agreed to do is to go ahead and handle all of our off-site mitigation. Now, on the 170 acres, we have a 17 and a half acre wetlands, and we have a one and a half acre uh, water impact. Williams agreed to do that. So what they did, working uh, with the Army Corps of Engineer, uh, they arranged an, uh, an agreement with a group called Penarac, I guess it's Fish Area Management, FMA, Fish Management Area. <clears throat> and they effectively are creating additional utilization for, uh, for environmental purposes. They bought land and contributed to this group and uh, to take care of not only our 17 and a half acre wetlands impact, but also the one and a half acre water impact. So there's no impact on our, on our site at all for that, which is, as we all know, very, 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 very valuable. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get that fish, far, fish ma management uh, area document yet, but it's coming in. Our only, our only participation with respect to this agreement was really to go ahead and pay $3.7 million. And we went ahead and paid the $3.7 million. And then that, of course, triggered the purchase of the property. The property was deeded to us, and it was, when it was deeded to us, it was deeded to the Board of Trustees of the University of South Florida. And in it, it had a reverter clause, because in their document, they were concerned that some of the pr promises that had been made, perhaps by others, would not be performed and if they weren't performed, they wanted the property back. One of them was if Polk County didn't put the road systems in that they said that they would, then they wanted the property back. Uh, that reverter clause has now been released. So there's no, re no reverter clause anymore to be worried or concerned about. And one of the reasons is Polk County has, in fact, agreed and, and actually has already developed over $90 million worth of road improvements for this property. $90 million. And, and that has already been done and accomplished. They, they uh, widened and improved Pace as well as Berkeley, uh, all of which were necessary for, for the property. The, also under, under this agreement, uh, there is a restrictive covenant which was signed and put, put of record. And this restrictive covenant basically put a thousand foot perimeter around the northern and western boundaries of the property where certain things couldn't be done. I'm quite confident that we are not in violation. However, we've asked our architect to go ahead and confirm that. We're still waiting for uh, that response. But it provides, it, it doesn't allow parking within so many feet of the perimeter as well. So, uh, but from the drawings, at least that I've seen, I don't think we have a problem, but we're getting final confirmation on, on that. Also, so through the tab seven basically is uh, verification of the payment of the purchase price. Tab eight is the architect's certificate, which I don't have yet. And then tab nine is the work schedule that Williams also agreed to perform. 
And, and as you'll see on the second page of that tab, uh, this is what the status is. Basically, you'll see that Williams has performed every single item that they said they were to perform. I think the only one being the uh, final completion, you know, of the uh, of the uh, road, the University Boulevard. But I think that may be done as well by now. But basically, Williams has been on track. They've done everything that they said that they would do. You got ninety million dollars worth of road work put in, you know, by the county. You have all your environmental taken care of. They've actually assisted in filing the Army Corps of Engineers permit. There are no federally controlled species on this property that impact the site. Uh, those that did impact, like the gopher tortoises or whatnot, those have all been taken care of. And Williams removed them to all in condos in Daytona Beach. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we, put, we put. I can tell you a story about that. <laughs> condos on Brahma Island. <laughs> we put little Ritz uh, uh, bathrooms on. Them. <laughs> I think they probably moved them to your site, the uh, chair, uh, chairman. It <laughs> <laughs> so. doesn't uh, surprise me one bit. <laughs> <laughs> so with respect to the, the, the agreement pertaining to the land, again, there's uh, some residual benefits. So when we assign it, we're still going to assign any rights that we have in that land to, uh, to the new university. The next critical document is basically the uh, campus development agreement. And this, this was a campus development agreement signed by the, the city of Lakeland and the trustees of the University of South Florida. What this provided for is that there was impact. What, what they did is they, they utilized a section under Florida law, section 1013.13, or point three, excuse me, which basically changed sort of the DRI rules and whatnot, but basically allows the university to go ahead and submit their master plan to the local government that would control the development of their property. Once the master plan is approved by that government, which in this case is the city of Lakeland, then when you are going to develop, all you have to do is you go and you show your, your permit, your request for permit to develop as per the master plan. So it's all been approved. But part of that, they do have mitigation responsibilities, and they had road mitigation. And part of the requirements was that uh, there are obviously traffic studies done and it came up that we had to pay $5,096,906 to go ahead and satisfy certain traffic mitigation. We've gone ahead and paid that. And you'll see that with respect to our my tabs coming up. So that's our fair share for the traffic work that the city of Lakeland is going to do. We've already know about the county with respect to their uh, work, road work that has already been done. They also have provided commitments, they basically are committing that they have available water and sewer to service the complete build-out of the Polytech site. Very, very important. And currently, their lines are being put in, sized at the capacity necessary to service the entire property, not just the property that's going to be developed with the new science building, for instance. So all that is coming in on their nickel. We, at our nickel, are going to hook up to that and then bring it onto the, onto the site. And we're, we're basically creating, effectively, a distribution system to, uh, for water and sewer of pipe size of the capacity as we go through the project. So all we would be doing as each new building comes in, we would just be hooking it up. We, as you'll note in tab 12, this sort of summarizes the responsibilities. Stormwater management, no financial arrangement, potable water, we pay whatever charges, but we don't have to pay for the line coming up. The waste wastewater, it's the same thing. We pay as, as we use it, but we don't have to pay for all of the infrastructure work. Solid waste, pay prevailing rate. Parks and recreation, no financial arrangement. And then the public transportation, we know we've already paid our fair share. I should have mentioned, actually, with the Williams, one, what, one of the other things that Williams did, which is part of our Army Corps as well as our uh, South, Southwest Florida Water Management Permit is that all of our stormwater drainage we put onto the Williams property and they've agreed to accept it and then move it down through the process, which again is really a tremendous benefit to the site. So we need to encumber some of our property with, with that kind of 
requirements. <coughs> I've reviewed over, you know, the the architect's agreement and the Skanska <coughs> agreement, and the architect's agreement basically has been performed to date. Everything that Calatrava has agreed to do, he's done on time on, and on, on the budget. Uh, we are actually, actually, uh, Dr. Murray is going up to New York, I think, next week to actually take possession of the final design documents. So everything is done. This building is ready to go. Matter of fact, in, in looking at the uh, resolution, uh, Mr. Chairman, that was prepared, where it said every, the facilities had to be in place, this project's in place because all of the nuclear documents to have it in, be, be built are there. And now it's just performing what those documents say. The architect's performing and Skanska's performing. Skanska has done everything on time and, and we're moving forward to getting a final GMP from them very shortly, you know, based on the final design drawings. So everything is working well and, my, and I compliment the, uh, the USF Poly team, as well as the USF executive staff that's been involved with the, with this process, they've done really a very very fine job in keeping this going. The there has been money already paid, and uh, I don't have that chart here for you, but I, but I will tell you that with respect to money's already paid to the architect. You know the architect had already been uh, paid with respect to the ca ca uh, master plan work, which was part of their requirements. Uh, $827,000. So they did the master plan for the, uh, the architect did for the site? Yes, sir. Updated one. They, updated they, they did the an updated plan. master they plan. They updated. There's a prior master plan from 05 to 015, and now there's a new one from 10 to 20. And that's the one that Calatrava did. And that embraces the, the new iconic structure and things like so, that. So that for that, you paid $850,000? Approximately, yes, sir. Uh, can you tell me how much you paid for the... Uh, Basically, what they have done that you uh, that is going to be taken over, uh, that is 85,000 square feet uh, science building. That's net. The the gross That's square gross, footage is yes. 160,000 square feet. Okay. Uh, the net is approximately 90. We're it's round numbers at 90. Okay. See, um, this is where you know I mean between 85 and 90. That's, That's a big percentage big, yes, difference. Yes, is it 85 or is it 90? It's in the final, because of, of some of the, the, the minor shifts and changes in the final uh, uh, design uh, elements and whatnot, it has shifted things uh, in, in, in regard to what's available for net uh, assignable usage. Uh, let me give you one example on why there's some... some uh, I mean, you're going next week to take over the, the, the plans. For, yes. So they weigh down it's a, the road To be on honest the plan. with you, it's right about 87,000. Okay. Okay. So that gives you a, uh, I, I used that as, a, as an approximation. But one of the, one of the areas that was a, a shift for us a little bit was, um, for instance, sizing of, of quarters, because we wanted to make sure that our faculty who are going to be doing research in some of those laboratories had the, the sizing appropriate for them. For instance, there's some, um, some engineering type laboratories. One of the things we were asked was, can we make sure that the quarters are wider so that we can literally bring in pallets with equipment? And so our, our quarters are wider than we would normally have in most buildings in order to access those laboratories with those types of, of equipment coming in with pallets, pallet jacks, et cetera. Um, so that actually reduced a little bit of the size. We would have been probably closer to 90, but we reduced some of the sizes of the quarters. Um, excuse me, we, include, we increased some of the sizes of the quarters in order to be able to accommodate those things. And of course, that impacts your net to gross. So we are right at about 87,000 net square feet. How much is uh, the architect's fee for the this building? The architect's fee for mm -hmm. this building is 11% of 60 million. 60 million is the intended budget for construction of this building. And so his fee for this building was uh, was right at 6.6, <coughs> million plus some reimbursables. And um, the reimbursables, and I, unfortunately, I left my, my spreadsheet over there. Pete was about um, how much? Eight or 300. 500, 300. You've got it. With you. Yeah, three Thank three hundred and uh, two thousand. Thank you. And then three seven. 
370. Let me ask you this. The, the plan that you're going to get, those are working adjuncts? Yes, it's 100% construction documents okay. is what we are due to receive. Um, they're, they're due to be completed the 27th, which is a Friday, and I will be receiving those along with John White, our architect, on Monday the 30th. Okay. Um, Mr. Mitchell, um, by the way, how much was your beer for looking at all these? <laughs> Same as yours. <laughs> um, let, me, let me make a couple of comments on this because this is the business I'm in. Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, one is that um, um, as far as the, the, the Williams family, uh, this is the wonderful collaboration yes. of, uh, between the university and, and, and government right. and business. However, I will say as a developer, um, I'll pay you for University of South Florida to come to my 12,000 acre piece of property because I'll benefit from oh, the rest sure. of the land. Absolutely. But that benefit is good yes. because yeah. then I as a developer will create job mm -hmm. yes. and create people to come in and to that area. So that's wonderful, wonderful what they've done. Uh, it, it's great for that collaboration and things like this, but it's good for them, it's good for the university. Absolutely. Make no mistake about that. I think where the concern comes where the concern comes on our board, on behalf on our board and our, uh, some of our board members, and us in the business, you know, um, um, that the um, we uh, we get beat up by the legislators and the governor's office about you know, uh, especially t today with uh, not having enough money for Pico. Dropping people, we're just getting a brand new letter. How much yeah. they want to drop in people money and all of that. When you have center sitting in a room, and and you say you're going to build a sixty, you're going to build a hundred and sixty thousand square feet net, eighty five or eighty seven thousand uh, for sixty million dollars. That's a lot of money. I assure you, that's lots of money. That is, I have built building after building. I have a, right now a building that's getting ready, a science building, just like your building by far cheaper, by far cheaper, that is going to be built per square feet, no question. Architect's fee, famous architect, very well known, you know, international architects, uh, 140,000 square feet, $1.2 million. You paid $6 million. You know, that's the difference. That's what it got our attention. I can't sit here today and when, when you talk about you know, going through SACs and all that, I'm not an expert on that. But I can assure you uh, that it is a huge cost and expense. And, and we, on the Board of Governors, we kind of like, what do you, what you guys are doing? I mean, and, and makes it even more difficult for us to go back and try to get other buildings and things like this, you know. So, this is not um, this issue of building. You know, um, uh, um, some of my colleagues think that, well, because this huge, expensive building is going to get built, and and maybe we should not have uh, go through the independence and all. It just just has is one very small item in the overall picture. But um, we are concerned. Uh, I'm concerned. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm very concerned that um, we pay. And, and by the way, architect is a great architect. I've heard it, uh, of the name and and uh, very well known. But is it that important when I can't pay for the maintenance of University of South Florida to maintain their building to pay six and a half million dollars for a. Um, um, you know, for an architect's fee, that it could be a 1.2 million or 1.5 million dollars, and then be a beautiful building. So that's where the the rub is. That you know, we ask that uh, uh, Mr. Lamb, yourself, and others. You know, I think that's more for the administration and the overall uh, board to look at this process of overall building. You know, how do we build buildings, and and what do we do in the future? And that is kind of more palatable uh, to us today. You know, if the state of Florida had more money that knew what to do with, uh, then I would say that's just wonderful. You know, let's just go spend uh, and, um, and, and, and do this, you know. So that's where the rub is, really. But I can tell you this. 
you have no idea how much I appreciate what you go over with me. And, and you know, I understand, you know, when you say you get 170 acres net usable acres and who, you know, and so that you have a study all that, you know all of that. I, I think to me it's a, uh, it gives us really feel good that we're going to have the new university, the new polytechnic is going to have a site that is it's somebody of your caliber has looked at the overall picture and say, uh, you're in a safe zone. You know, there is nothing in the future that says, you know, oh, by the way, you've got to pay so much, you know, to, to start the building. So th that's where the rub is. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, the, uh, you know, with respect to the architect's contract, uh, you're, you're right. I've been involved in projects where architecture fees are, are much less. I've been involved with other projects where there is a internationally acclaimed architect involved where the architecture fees are much higher. Matter of fact, this fee is substantially higher. The team had negotiated Calatrava down substantially from his fee. And in addition, you know, it was the message, I think, that was trying to be communicated uh, with an iconic building. You know, and in the iconic building, you have a lot of special program systems built in to try to take this building for the next 20 to the 22nd century. So, you know, it is, it's not a cookie cutter building. It's not a building like we see around here. This is unique, has a lot of unique architectural characteristics. It's going to set the tone and the tenor for the campus. And that was the reason why the decisions were made along the line to do this. The contracts obviously have been signed. He's already been paid. Calatrava has been paid basically almost his fee. Yeah, right. and we're, we're so not we, we're arguing not, over that. But I, under, I understand your, uh, your your point. Then there was a, you know a great deal of, of discussion you know with respect to that uh, architects agreement and with respect to this campus. Uh, but personally, you know I looked at it. Is it supportable? Yes, it's supportable. I believe it's supportable. And you'll you'll have some people say, how in the world can we spend that kind of money? There are so many other intangibles associated with it. We have to take the intangibles and then we have to convince them. Yeah. You can do it. Okay. I'm going to sure. address that just a little bit sure. as well. Um, typically, a con and then, first of all, this is an all-in contract. This is not just a design fee. This is all in. It's architecture, engineering. It's the whole package. Yeah, I understand that. And it's typically based on a percentage of your estimated cost of, of construction. The university's standard, and this is for all facilities, has typically been anywhere from 7 to 13 percent. We're at 11. So we really fell within that range. I will tell you that the, this particular architect's normal design only fee is 18 percent. And I'm going to give a little bit of kudos to two people who are currently in the room who did an amazing job of bringing this down to something more in line with where our standards would be. And that's Mr. Carmen uh, Sanis that, you, that uh, Christy Mitchell introduced before, and Steve DeVoe, the general counsel of the University of South Florida. Um, you know, you say the percentage, $60 million for $85,000, 85,000 square feet, or 87,000 square feet. It's lots of money. Right. And, you know, I cannot tell you, no, and no. I don't want to, you know, no, I'm, I cannot that. tell you that I agree with you. I, I really don't agree with you that you pay, um, you pay $60 million, you know. Um, I understand all the iconic you want to build, but I still can't pay for the maintenance of the University of South Florida or University of Florida because we got cut last year. You are not in that position, and you get to build. Let me, yeah, you get to build a sixty million dollar building for eighty-seven thousand dollars net not usable. I, I, I want to shorten this because this is really a very small part. This is, a, I think, different talk for a different day. Um, but it, is, it has got the attention of the Board of Governors because we're worried that uh, we're worried that the legislators and the governor that have the veto pen and budget that they're going to sit there and it says, "What you all are doing is spending this kind of money." Um, <coughs> and um, so, with that said, um, I appreciate that. Let me, if I could finish up real quick, with sure. I won't go through the rest, but in tab 15, it specifies exactly what they have done, the architect in Skanska has done, so you get a timeline. But the one that I want to bring up was the very last tab. And this is another example of the relationship with the local community. Uh, we're putting a ring road in on the campus. It costs $10 million. Polk County is going to reimburse 
USF Board of Trustees for that $10 million. They've already done $90 million with respect to growth. So you could just see it's exactly what you, s you said, Chairman. Partnership. It, it was a partnership. And it's been very effective and very well uh, documented and negotiated by the USF Poly team. Chairman Lamb, could would I, you, were, were you going to ask? Sure. sure. Let me just yeah, yeah, let uh, I, I think um, um, I want. know you, the only reason I'm going to speak to it is because I think, I think we are on the same page in terms of going forward. The purpose that I talked about around a foundational theme for the Oversight Committee was to address exactly what Chair Hassani and, and, and Governors you're, you're speaking about. I made a point early at the very onset of the meeting that we're going to be looking at making sure we're spending the resources wisely and effectively. As we look at historical decisions, uh, you know, we always, uh, even in our business, sometimes can look at what could have potentially have been done better. I think today the commitment you've got from the Oversight Committee around that accountability is we're going to get it right and continue to get it right going forward. Because this isn't the last building or facility we're going to build. Right. Right. And that's the only reason we're discussing That's it. the only it's reason. the future. Right? We're not exactly. going back. That's we right. know we have a contract. We know we got plans. We know all of that. I mean, we've been there, done that. Uh, Governor Chair. Just, just for the record, yes, I, I want to thank you, uh, Trustee Mitchell. That's excellent job you've done. Thank you. Um, I think there's been some confusion uh, that's been published in the media about whether or not this project followed all of the the ways that everything else has been built at USF. Is, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, somehow uh, there seems to be an idea that that they didn't follow. Uh, I understand. You know what they've the done in the past. Yeah. You don't find that to be true, do you? I, I don't. I haven't per personally looked at it, but I, I have dealt with USF in the past, and I would find it hard to believe that they didn't follow it to the letter. So it went through the committee process. Absolutely. It, it, had, it had campus input, but final decisions were made by USF Jesus. itself. Is it, that? it was Jesus. vetted through all of the appropriate Jesus. channels. We had an open RFP process, probably more open than this university has had in any other project. Um, there were uh, many, many proposers on the project, both at the, the AE um, side as well as on the CM side. Uh, we had council involved with us throughout the process to assure that we followed every letter of the law um, uh, that was you know, required, that we followed every single um, requirement to vet it through every single entity of the institution all the way up. Uh, to the president's office, it, it it could not have had any broader, more open and transparent process, um, and certainly followed every single iota of the university's process every step of the way. So, I, my what I'm coming to is, we may disagree about the project. Some may like it, some may not like it. We may disagree about whether we overspent or we didn't spend enough. But, but as far as going through the system, mm -hmm. do any of you have any questions that you could tell us that it wasn't fully vetted and done the way all projects have been done at USF? I, I've been a part of it all the way through, so I can tell you that for my part and for the colleagues that I've worked with both on the Poly campus as well as um, at the USF Tampa system uh, side, We've done every single thing in our power to make sure that there was absolutely no question about us meeting every criteria we needed to meet. And again, I, I thank my colleagues for you know for assisting me in that process. And, and Governor Tripp, I think you're we followed the process. Is, is what is what you're trying to say? Yes, I, mean, I just want to make sure it's clear you because there have been a, a lot of questions out there about somehow sure. this not, not being. So everybody could see what was going on. Mm -hmm. Now we may disagree at the end of the day. Some may disagree mm -hmm. about whether you made a good decision. That's that's not what I'm talking about. As long our job is, I think, to make sure that what we have today is something that we can say was truly vetted. Whether or not we right. as a group somehow decide to go as a different direction down the road, that's a different thing. When was the decision made? It was made a year or two ago, wasn't it? 
I'm sorry, sir. How long ago was, was the, the decision? The Calatrava decision? Yeah. Oh, was, probably closer to three, three and a half years ago. Very different time. 2007. Yeah. 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 2007. Mm -hmm. Seven, eight. Okay. It's been a while. Yes. Mr. Mayor, just really quickly. Yes. Before, and it I'm was gonna, before the... Yeah, yeah. Very I'm, I'm going to risk the redundancy here, here but, <clears throat> um, but as we give way this part of the conversation to the next part of the conversation, somewhere when we talk about Walt Disney, I am sure that the original renderings laid out uh, for, uh, for the creek area don't resemble what is actually sitting over there right now. And, and I think that's really important because there's original visions, even by geniuses in architecture and engineering, that over time morph based on economics, based on physical need, based on program array. And, and I think to your very good point, what we're talking here is what was and is, but very importantly setting the stage for where we go from here. Right. And I think there is, a, there is a belief in some people's mind that when we talk about the, the initial building, we're talking about a rubber stamp for every facility that sits on that campus for the next 20 years. I would venture to say, and then I'll stop. When we look back 20 years from now, the original vision will have changed for a variety of reasons that we're not even able to sit here and contemplate today as to what the final, uh, final campus looks like 20 years from now. It's the process that is critical to all of this, right. that we all are uh, <coughs> wedded to a process that assures us not only the best bang for the buck, but also the highest quality facilities to marry with the unique niche nature of a polytechnic institution. Thank okay. you for indulging. Thank you for letting me uh, um, uh, say my, say my uh, okay. Next one, uh, Madam President, do you want to go into the uh, oh, is it you want to go to lunch? Yeah, yeah. they want lunch too. Send a schedule. Uh, I think it's a it's a it's a great idea. Uh, it's like we want to take like a fifteen minutes break and get it real sure. quick, uh, and lunch and come back fifteen minutes. You know, because well, we need to we get going. Box, I guess that we're the box lunches. Yeah, there are box lunches outside. And for the audience. And for the audience. Uh, Yours is five ninety five. Charge back. Outside the door. And, and thank you. And so we will be back in um, 15 minutes, something like this. Yeah. 1245.